Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash and this is episode 80 in the series. I'm calling this one Utter Massage and Color Management and yes, you heard that right. Utter Massage is a big part of this cast today. <laughs> um, so I'm coming to you from Urbana, Illinois where we have sheep, obviously. <laughs> and uh, I'm a professor at the university there. I teach science fiction and speculative fiction. A lot of you guys know that already about me. Um, and it's a beautiful Sunday here. Uh, I'm spending some time in the yarn room early in the morning. I just got up and did all the farm chores, ate breakfast, took the dogs for their walk. Um, Spencer has been out helping Phineas move. Uh, he, he's in the Air Force and they had to move bases and it's been crazy in the pandemic. So Spencer was really kind and drove down there and helped them out for a week. So I've been here alone with the animals, <laughs> which has been, uh, wow, it gives me a lot of respect for a lot of uh, those tough women and men who are out there, uh, you know, having their farms and taking care of the animals and just taking care of business by themselves. And that has been uh, an awesome experience, very empowering, but also exhausting. So I've been going to bed every night, just like passing out, waking up at five to uh, take care of the chickens and the rooster. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, let me get back to what we're doing today. <laughs> so uh, utter massage and color management. I want to talk to you about my um, new sweater, which is the Bisou sweater um, by Paula Pereira. And I'm about halfway through my Janice Hope's uh, Persian Knits blanket. And uh, what else do I have for you? Oh, I have a fun Neighborhood Fiber Company t-shirt and a little bit of a follow-up from the last cast for you. And what else do I have? Um, just lots of fleece and sheep stuff. So we'll get into all of it today. It should be fun. If you're looking for me online, uh, you can find me just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash here on YouTube, over on Ravelry, on um, Instagram, and on the blog, which is uh, knittingthestash.wordpress.com. And if you're interested in following the sheep around, because Kathy dropped off some sheep last week uh, to pasture here for the summer, it's we call it sheep summer camp, really. Uh, but if you're interested in kind of following the sheep around for the next couple of months, I usually post all those photos over on Instagram. And I do talk about it on the podcast, but the most recent photos will usually be up on Instagram if you're interested in that kind of stuff. So why don't I, um, why don't I begin with a quick follow-up from the last cast. Episode 79, we talked about... Um, protest and knitting. I gave out some um, names of books that I've been reading for my speculative fiction and science fiction classes. Um, and we did a little fundraiser for um, racial, racial justice and inequality. Um, and thanks to you guys, we raised about, I, I rounded up, we raised about $60 for um, racial injustice organizations. So I donated to um, Race Forward which I thought was kind of appropriate. They're um, an institute that's been, or a nonprofit that's been around since 1981. Um, and they work on research about social and systemic racial injustice. So they put together a lot of actual like number statistics, information pamphlets, um, and get information out there. They're also active um, in the community and they have a podcast called Momentum. So it's a cool organization. You might want to check them out, Race Forward. Thank you so much to those of you who bought um, yarn from my shop, my stash sale. Um, and those proceeds went to um, to that donation. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm wearing my, I was so excited this came in time for the podcast. Um, this is my Neighborhood Fiber Company t-shirt. I think it's really cool. It says community over here. Um, and Neighborhood Fiber Company is a wonderful um, black owned yarn, indie dyed yarn company uh, out of Baltimore. Karita has had the shop, I think for 11 years now, going on maybe 12 years. And she names her colorways after um, different urban neighborhoods around Baltimore and D the DC area. So I think right now she's offering free domestic shipping, which is <laughs> kind of amazing. So if you're needing to um, up your stash a little bit, uh, I think, this was a pre-sale. I don't know if they still have these going on, but they might. They have other really cool t-shirts if you want to um, sport your sport your support. <laughs> they have cool t-shirts um, and their work is really great. So there's another um, cool company and, and place to look for and, and check out. Um, so that's our kind of like update from last time. Uh, let's see, what else should I tell you? I think that's usually it uh, about intro stuff. Um, I hope you all are well. Uh, it's pandemic craziness around the country still. Um, there's still protests going on. We're living in quite a time, uh, and I hope you all are well and taking care of yourselves and taking care of each other. All right, let's jump in with, um, how about some fleece and sheep before we do color management? Let's do utter massage first. Okay, 
So the, for the last, this is the second summer running um, when Kathy of Seven Sisters Farm, who's my buddy from my spinning guild, um, she keeps a, a flock of sheep and she's had long wolves for a long time and then she's transitioned over to Corydales and some Teeswaters. And this is the second summer that she has pastured uh, a group of sheep here at our farm. So we have about um, two or three acres out back in the back pasture beyond the dog fences and the chicken coop and the garden, um, which is just grass. This used to be a horse farm where we live now, so there's a barn out there. Um, and if you've watched Spencer's, uh, my husband's um, YouTube channel, you've seen the garden and the barn and some of the other stuff out there. Um, so out in the pasture, we've been keeping sheep. This is our second summer running. And Kathy brought over 10 sheep this time. We have some return campers. <laughs> we have um, Cindy Crawford is back. She is tall and long-legged and very beautiful. And I'll try to get little portraits of them and post them on Instagram so you can get to know them individually. Um, it's a very friendly group this year. So we've got Cindy Crawford. We have <laughs> um, Fiona, who was a bottle baby, who actually sat on my lap for a long time during spinning group one day and fell asleep on me when she was a little lamb. So I was so glad to see her come out as a yearling. Um, we have um, Ginny and Cleo, who are both first-time moms, so they, the way Kathy does it is if, if the sheep have had lambs, then they get names instead of just their numbers. So Cleo and Jenny are new. Um, and Rose is a new mom. Uh, Rose is Fiona's sister, and she wasn't supposed to have a lamb this year, but you know, sometimes stuff happens in the past year. So she had a lamb, and it's a very cute little lamb. Um, and she is the reason that this episode is called Utter, Man, Utter Massage. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Um, who else is out there? Um, Dolly's back. Dolly was named by Spencer um, last year. She hadn't yet had a lamb, but Spencer named her because she's just a doll. She would just follow us around and ask for apples and baa at us, and she's just adorable. So anyway, she's back. Does that everybody? Let's see. Cindy, Fiona, Ginny, Cleo, Rose, and Dolly. Yeah, and then we have four other yearlings who are just numbers, but they don't have names yet, but they will. Um, and we actually need a name for one of them because it's kind of a special sheep. So that'll be coming up on a later cast, I think. Uh, so we have these sheep out here. They're, they're pasturing on the grass for the most part. Um, they're out of the barn. They're not eating hay or anything. Um, but Kathy, when she dropped them off, she said, okay, one thing to watch for is to make sure that their um, udders, their bags, where they, you know, the, the teats that they actually um, feed their babies with, um, they've just been weaned. So make sure that those bags are drying up and kind of like going away so that, you know, no one's in pain, no one's getting like mastitis, you know, all the same things that can happen to humans, it seems like can happen to sheep once you're doing that weaning process. This may be too much information. I don't You'll tell me in the comments. Uh, so <laughs> I've been watching the sheep utter for udders for a couple of days, and I noticed that Rose's udders just weren't quite kind of drying up like the rest of them were. So I called Kathy, and Kathy said, okay, well, let's try putting her in the barn on some hay feed, some dry feed, just a couple times a day. So you kind of like, um, to one of the ways to dry them out if they're having trouble, I guess, is you feed them a little bit less of a rich diet and kind of keep them penned up in the barn to eat that hay. Um, and you give them about a week or so and it's, you know, it's supposed to help. So we tried that for um, a few days and I actually swapped in. There, were, there was one other ewe that looked a little like maybe she needed to do the same um, treatment. And then Dolly got swapped in. Anyway, there was some head budding. It was a little bit wild, but Rose was not really doing like the best that she could have. So Kathy came out and her husband Ken came out and they went in the barn and this is during a pandemic. So everybody's masked up, we're out in the barn. Like she's there in the barn, I'm outside. I'm trying to listen to hear what I should do. And Kathy's just like, how do you feel about utter massage? <laughs> and I was just like, come again? <laughs> what? Uh, so apparently one of the things you can do with sheep if they're having trouble drying up their udders is you can just you know, do what you uh, you would try to do to like um, get the their body to kind of reabsorb some of the milk and stop producing it as much is you can just rub their udders. So yeah, that's what I've been doing for a week. Uh, I go out in the morning and lunchtime and then in the evening and 
give them their flake of hay and Rose will just, I put my hand on her back very gently, just kind of let her know I'm there and then I just like literally massage her udders. And her udders have, udders are cool, okay? <laughs> and you know they were that cool. Now it's not milking. This is not milking because we don't want to, we don't want to like get the milk to express itself because that would make her potentially produce more milk. So all we're doing is kind of like rubbing the lobes of her udders and her udders, I'm not sure if this is true of all sheep, I'm an udder noob, <laughs> an udder noob to udder massage. But um, her udders have two lobes it feels like and so you kind of like just squish it up, you just kind of squish up the udders. And you're feeling for like hard spots and you're feeling like you're just trying to like massage it so that everything kind of gets reabsorbed. So I've been doing it for, let's see, I guess it was four days maybe. And I noticed even just after the first day when Kathy had done it, they were much smaller the next day, the two lobes. And then the third day they were much smaller and the fourth day they were much smaller. So I called Kathy back up and she said, yeah, if, they, if it's shrinking back up, they can go out on the pasture. And so yeah, I checked them this morning and the two ladies were free of the barn and free of their udder massage. <laughs> Though I think Rose actually um, enjoyed the udder massage. She seemed to really like it. I mean, and I would imagine that if, if you've got like a, an udder that's full of milk, it might feel really good to just have it be massaged. I'm not a sheep. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing. She seemed to enjoy it. Um, yeah, never thought I'd do udder massage, but it was it was fun. It was a nice way to get to know Rose. <laughs> so ask your comments in the question, or ask your questions in the comments, and uh, I will ask Kathy if there's any other follow-up or clarification I can provide. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, it was an interesting experience, and I learned so much from Kathy. She's a wonderful shepherdess. She's been doing this for a long, long time, and every time I go to her house to help with worming or shearing or lamb or anything, and every time the sheep come out here to pasture, I just learned something new. Last year it was hoof care and um, minerals and this time it's baking soda for the you know first time that they're on the grass and it's about udder massage and anyway I'm learning about sheep as we go and it's a wild ride but it's really really fun <laughs> yeah okay so that's udder massage um, in other news uh, we sh I shipped off the fleece from last year this this past uh, year's clip. This, I guess it was May. They, they were sheared in May. So I got everything skirted as you saw a couple videos ago and I packed it all into tight boxes and like air compressed everything and uh, UPS did a pickup which was great so I didn't have to you know go out in the pandemic and ship it. They just showed up at the garage, picked up the boxes, off to Stonehenge Fiber Mill and Deb um, and we should hear back soon about that. Um, one thing I'm gonna do this time around with the shorn and three yarn is that I want to get some other designers involved, maybe some new designers, some designers um, from the uh, black, indigenous, people of color community who have designed before or maybe you're new to designing. Um, so more information will be coming out about that, but I'm gonna put out a call for designs for the new yarn. Um, sometime in the next couple of months, I'm gonna get all my stuff together, I'll put it up as a blog post and I'll put it on the podcast. So if you are a, designer who is interested in working with a farm yarn, this might be your chance. It could be really fun. So yeah, break out your pens and your sketchbooks and uh, I'll have more information about that soon. Okay, so that's the sheep part of our episode. <laughs> sheep and udders, it's lovely stuff. Um, let me talk a little bit about color management and this really cool sweater I've been working on. So. Um, uh, the new, I've got this magazine that I'm pretty much obsessed with. Um, Amirisu Magazine, which is out of Japan, uh, came out with their new issue just this past week. And I usually, I, what I want to do, maybe it's my birthday's coming up, maybe I'll ask for a subscription, that would be kind of fun. Um, but I love to look through their patterns for their new issues. And this is, their, their latest issue had a bunch of beautiful sweaters in it. Um, one of them, I'm gonna try to show you some of these. I printed them out. I got the e-copy instead of the hard copy because I was just too excited about it. So the one that I really fell in love with is this guy, this lady. This is um, a really interesting like linen, wool, cotton kind of blend. Um, and it's uh, Hikari by uh, Yamagara. And I wanted to knit this and so I was swatching up a couple of yarns that I had in my stash. And they, the gauge of this one really calls for a pretty fine gauge, like 26 stitches over four um, inches. 
in a fingering weight yarn. So I used two different fingering weight yarns. One was too dark for this patterning because this one of the really awesome things about this sweater is that it has all of this amazing texture um, on the bottom of the sweater, which in the uh, on the actual pattern page on Ravelry it shows up amazingly well. So I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but I could not get gauge, and um, the first time I tried it with this darker color, I just knew the texture wasn't going to show up. So I swatched again with my pretty New Zealand wool from Mary at Mania Toto Wool because I love this. This was a sweater exchange that Mary and I did. I sent her some shorn and she sent me some of her beautiful hand dyed um, woolen spun yarn from New Zealand. This was back when like postage could act, you know, like the postal system could actually do these international exchanges. Um, so this is in the flax color, which I just think is so rich and gorgeous and beautiful. Um, but when I swatched with this, I still got like 21 stitches for four inches instead of 26, which is a huge difference on the, I mean, this was on like size three needles, US three needles. So that's a big difference. And I wasn't going to go down that many needle sizes because I'd be like on these tiny little needles. Um, so I just happened to look through the other patterns in the, um, Amirisu magazine and Bisu by Paula Pereira popped up as one of the other favorites I had in there. And this one calls for a gauge of about 20 stitches per inch. So I was like, I'm in business, 21's close enough. Um, and as I, as I said, I'm trying to work on a, um, an online class about um, how to modify your patterns and your sweaters. So eventually that will happen <laughs> when I have some time and I'm not caring for all the farm animals. Um, but one of the things that uh, I think about when I have a gauge swatch that's pretty close, like that 20 stitches instead of 21, is that you've got to be careful because even just one stitch um, can result in a size, a real size issue, a fit issue for your sweaters. But because I was at 20 instead of 21 and I liked the fabric and I had different sizing options, I just did some sweater math, which like I said, when this class gets put together, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, but basically, I took the number of stitches that they, that she had come up with in her pattern um, for different parts of the sweater, like for the bust or for this, you know, the, um, the waist or the neck, whatever it was. And I divided her number of stitches by the um, number of stitches you'd have in an inch based on her gauge in the pattern, right? That way I'd know what her inches look like, like how many inches she's expecting something to be, um, more specifically than even the schematic can tell you sometimes. Um, and I, then I did the same kind of math with my own gauge, and I figured out that I could use my needles that I'd been using and the gauge that I had. All I'd need to do is go up, one of the easiest things you can do is go up one sweater size, and you're not going to get the full increase in that sweater size. So like I'm, a, I'm using this and I'm knitting the size 40 inch bust, but because of my gauge, what I'm going to end up with is actually more like a 37 inch bust, which will be absolutely perfect. That'll give me about three, three centimeters of ease. Um, if it ends up being 38, I get four centimeters or four inches of ease and that's fine too. Um, so that's my quick, quick and dirty that I, I'd be glad to explain. Um, at length somewhere else. And I do have a video up about sweater math where I talk about how to do that kind of calculation. Um, so basically I kept my gauge, kept my needles, kept my everything and went up one pattern size and then I'm kind of modifying from there. So right now, as you can see on the mannequin, which is about my size, she's pretty close to my size. Um, it's fitting really nicely and kind of perfectly. It's going to have a little bit of ease um, once it's all washed and dried and off the, it's a little tight because right now it's on the needles, which are <laughs> barely holding on in the back there. Um, so it's actually bigger. If it, I put it on an extra set of needles and put it on myself just to see, um, and it actually is just perfect. So, so yeah, so this is Bisu. That's the size I'm doing. And that's the modification that I did in order to use this particular yarn and these, these needles, because I really love this fabric. Um, and that's something else that's kind of important when you're knitting a sweater is if you get a gauge swatch where you like the fabric, the kind of density of it, the thickness of it, whatever it is, um, and you may not want to go up or down a needle size because you might end up creating a fabric that's really too dense or that's too loose just to get gauge. So you got to be aware of all those kinds of things when you're thinking about it. But the main thing with this what I want to talk about today is color management because um, I'm using the Mania Toto hand dyed yarn and Mary kind of sent me a little warning in the email just to say that, 
you know, because it's batch dyed, hand dyed yarn, um, it's best to alternate skeins, just as a reminder. And this is something that a lot of you guys know already. When you're using hand dyed yarn that, that's not coming from a big company, that's coming from like a smaller kind of indie company, you often want to alternate your skeins because one skein might have just a slight variation in the hue of the color. Am I doing that right? Is it hue? I think it is. A slight variation. Um, and if you uh, swap skeins out, then you're much more likely to get a kind of even tone in your fabric and less likely to get some color pooling. Now, I've done other sweaters where I've just knit and just said, oh, whatever, this was like early in my knitting career. And you do end up with bands of color sometimes. So like, you know, if you knit the top with one skein and then you switch to the next, you're going to have just a little bit of a difference. Sometimes it's a big difference. Um, so what I did for this one is I started off with one skein of yarn up here at the top. And I was, I was playing around with color a little bit, as, you, as you'll see as we go along here, um, in part just to see how variable this yarn actually is. Um, so I started with one skein at the top, and I think you can see that this, this is all just one skein, and then I wanted to wait to swap in um, the next skein until I was at a place where it might look like it was intentional, just in case there was a real color difference. Um, and I didn't want to start with like two or three skeins at the top because the tops of sweaters that are tops top-down sweaters can be kind of fiddly when you're trying to cast on all your stitches and you're trying to set up your increase rows and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, and I'm working in the flat up at the top here because this is open, right? So I was working back and forth, back and forth. And I was like, I don't really want to get another skein involved right away. So I'm going to do this in, an, in a way that kind of looks intentional. And I, and I like the way it came out. So I started in, I introduced my alternating skein here. And I think it kind of looks cool because it's got this, it creates this kind of um, effect. And I think with the Henley, it actually works really well. It wouldn't work really well with all sweaters. And I noticed, of course, that there is some difference in the second skein that I introduced. So I did that for a little while and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. But what if I introduce a third skein? So right about here is where I introduced the third skein of yarn. And you can see that all of a sudden you get rid of the striping and you get into this kind of more marled effect where you're actually um, really combining the colors by, by knitting um, each row with a different, or each round with a different color. And I've got three skeins going on there. Um, now, what I, what I, one thing I realized is that as I was knitting along and I got to the, um, this, the part where it's actually joined in the round, um, it's one thing to kind of knit in the flat with three skeins of yarn because what I was doing was uh, knitting across with one, leaving it there, <clears throat> introducing the second over here, knitting back, leaving it here, so now I've got one on each side, and then introducing a third, and then knitting across with a third. And then I'd leave the third, pick up the first, come back, leave the first, pick up the second, right? So you're, you really are exchanging those yarns as you're going back and forth when you've got three skeins. And that's why you get this really nice kind of um, mixed up marled color effect here rather than any kind of striping or pooling. Um, once I got into the round, uh, there's a, there's a um, way to knit, it's called helical knitting, where you, it's basically like a joggless stripe. So if you imagine your two, say you're just using two, two skeins of yarn and you were knitting um, with stripes and you were about to finish one and pick up the other, if you do that just right at, you know, just exactly at the place where they meet, you'll end up with a jog because knitting is actually a spiral, right? So it's if you're going down or up, whichever way you're knitting. So you'd end up with a color jog where your colors would actually sit like this. Um, but helical knitting allows you to um, slip a few stitches and pick up your next yarn and so it ends up sitting a lot neater in terms of um, that joglessness when you're switching colors. You're switching skeins off it's very much like striped knitting except that you don't see the stripes if you're doing it the right way <laughs> um, if you've got two skeins that are actually marling really nicely. Um, so once I got to the round I, I decided to do the helical knitting which means that um, 
I broke off most of my yarns and restarted them and I would knit up to uh, pretty close to where the other yarn was hanging and I'd slip those three stitches, drop the yarn, slip th three stitches, and then pick up that yarn again and keep going. There's a great video about this that I'll link to in the show notes. Um, and I decided to go with two skeins at that point because I had determined as I was knitting along which two skeins were the closest in color to each other. So there were two of the three that had a kind of darker, um, a darker marl to them than the third. The third is very light and looks a lot like this. Um, and so I decided to just swap out two skeins as I was going in the round and doing this helical knitting. And I think you can see the result there is really pretty great. It looks nice and marled up and just kind of flows pretty seamlessly from the other part of the sweater. So that's what I'm doing right now. And you might say to yourself, what are you gonna do about the sleeves? Well, luckily I have four skeins of yarn and um, I'll see how much of this I have left over. I'm gonna try to, if I can't find two skeins that are close, kind of like I did for the body here, I'm going to try to find um, a way to work with three skeins in the round that works for me for the sleeves. And all that'll do is produce this very marled fabric that I have here. And I already have a sample of it. It'll be just fine. Um, so there won't be a marked difference between the body and the sleeves, which is also a consideration for color management. <laughs> so much going on when you even when you're just working, it seems like you're just working with one color, but really you're working with this kind of like array of just slight variation. And if you're careful about it and thoughtful about it, you can really make it work for you in some pretty interesting ways. I hope that makes sense. I'm gonna put some links down below about helical knitting, um, jog, jogless stripes, stuff like that, so that if you need some specific tutorials to kind of follow up on what I was saying, you'll be able to go there and check it out. Um, in the meantime, I'm pretty excited about this sweater, and part of my plan with this is I'm not only modifying it because of the gauge and because of um, the yarn and some other things, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna add a few details to the cuffs. Um, this is meant to be a kind of puffed sleeve sweater, um, three-quarter length, very short cropped sweater. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to go full length, full sleeves, and it's going to be in wool rather than a kind of summery cotton linen um, sweater style, which, you know, a lot of people do for summer, um, is go with like a lighter yarn, like a linen or a cotton. I want this to be a winter sweater, so it's going to be all wool, um, and it'll be long sleeves and long and all that kind of thing that I like. Yeah. So that is color management. <laughs> I think we managed to get through utter massage and color management all in one podcast. And I guess maybe on that note, I will sign off for the day. I have a rooster out back. Um, our friends in the city, <laughs> in the neighborhoods over in Urbana, um, it kind of, he was an accidental rooster and they needed a place for him. So he's been out there. And he's not exactly integrated with the flock at the moment, so he's kind of stalking the chicken run all the way around. I go out there two or three times a day and give him food, and he has fresh water, but he just doesn't want to do anything but try to sit with the ladies. So he's yet another animal that needs a little bit of extra care right about now. <laughs> so, so I think I'll sign off. Maybe uh, do a little knitting before I go out and do animals and garden and, and everything else. But I hope you guys are staying well, taking care of yourselves and each other. Um, I always love coming in here to hang out with you. If you have comments and messages, anything you want to share, please do so. I love hearing from you in the comments here. I get emails, I get messages on Ravelry, and I absolutely love all the conversations that we're having. So um, please keep it up, and I look forward to seeing you guys in another couple of weeks. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.